actual image. So we do that, we set the drawable, and we display the image on the screen. All right? We then shuffle all of the file names that are in play. Okay? We pull off the correct answer. This would be a really good question. Why do we do this? We pull off, we find the correct answer in the array list. We remove it from wherever it is and put it at the very end, okay? We do that because we don't want to put, we want to make sure that the country, uh, the country that's the correct answer, we want to make sure that that doesn't appear twice in the correct answer, in, in the list of possible answers. So we push it way at the end of the list of files. We then go and we create the buttons, either two, four, six, or eight, depending on it. And we set the name of the button to the file name that we pull out of, or the country name that we pull out of the file name. Because again, we strip off the rest of the stuff and in that function, and we end up grabbing just the country name to put on the button. So at this point, we're displaying our flag, we're displaying whatever text fields are up there, and we're displaying however many buttons we said we wanted with the names of uh, the countries on it. Could you explain where you say uh, right there, string file name, yeah. and you're doing the row times two plus the column? I yes. understand what that is doing, but how does that know that we've got the correct column, the correct name? Okay. The file name list is a one-dimensional array, right? And our grid of buttons is sort of a two-dimensional structure, right? So effectively what we have to do is we have to map a two-dimensional structure uh, into a one-dimensional array, or vice versa. No, I think I said it right. So in other words, let's put some actual values up here. Let's say we have six buttons, and they're arranged like this. All right? We're going to have a loop. We're going to have nested loops that go through this. We're going to have an outer loop that goes through the rows one at a time. We're going to have an inner loop that goes through the columns. So this is going to be for I equals zero, I less than, in this case, three, or the value of some variable that has a value of three. This is going to be 4J equals zero, J less than two, or some variable that has that in there. So we're going to loop through this, and we're going to look at this button the first time through the loop, then this button the second time through this loop. So the first time through the bigger loop, we're looking at the first row. The inner loop then looks at the first column, second column. The second loop executes again. So we're looking at the second row. First row, second column. Uh, first column, second column. First row, first column, second column. So you get how that works, right? Now, what we have to do is we sort of have to map this to our one-dimensional array that has a list of countries. So our list of countries is an array, and maybe the order is this. It 
so on. text. 
you clicked on you, you you know that view with something else, you know it would blow up. You get a runtime error if it tried to cast it to something uh, that it wasn't. So we get the correct answer, or I'm sorry, we yeah we get the guess. We get the correct answer. We increment the number of guesses. Okay. <laughs> we compare using the equals function. All right. We're not going to use a double equal sign. Why not? Why don't we use a double equal sign here? Why do we use the dot equals function? Dot equals checks for the value held inside the variable, whereas the double equals checks for the uh, location, location. Right. In other words, given that these strings are object reference pointers, if we use the, the equal equal, we would be asking, are those the exact same object? That's not what we're, we're worried about. We're asking, are those two string objects that contain the same string? That's a different question. All right. So we ask for equals because we want to see, does this string object have contain the same string as this string object? Not, are they the identical object? If it's correct, we increment, or we display some stuff. We change the text color, we disable the guess buttons. Uh, if we're all done, we pop up this dialog that tells them what the total score was. Now, how come they used a double equal right there? Double equal where? Well, what do you think? They want to know if it's exactly the answer in the quiz. No. Because if there was 10 flag questions and you had 10 correct answers, they would technically be the same thing. Right. It's a little different. What, co what kind of data is correct answers? What data type is correct answers? It's probably an N. Let's look for that. Yep, correct answers is an N. An N is what kind of data? Is it an object reference or is it something else? <coughs> it's a primitive. It's a primitive, right? And therefore, when you could compare, when you compare primitives, if you use the equal equal, you are comparing the contents of the variable, which is the value of the integer, which is what we want. So really, the complete answer is that in one case, you're comparing two strings. Strings are object references. And therefore, equals is what you use to make sure the contents of two strings are equal. Integers are primitives. And, which are not object references. Therefore, the integer variable itself contains the value of the integer. Therefore, you use equal equal instead of that. All right, where were we? Let me get back to this. I'm clicking this now. Okay. We disable buttons. If we're all correct, we pop up a little alert that says what their score was, and we're good to go. All right. Now, this is something that is uh, something that will probably be useful in the. Um, card game example. Because when you click the card game, you're going to click one card, you're going to click a second card. So you click one card, you turn it over. You click a second card, you turn it over. All right? You want the user to have a chance to see what those cards are. <laughs> right? You don't want to click it over and click it over, eh, it was wrong. You know, and have it return back like that. Right? So you want there to be a little bit of a delay before it goes on. All right? So that's what this does. This delays. This gets executed 
if they got the answer correct, but it's not the last question. So let's say here, that's Lebanon. So I press this, it's correct, two second pause and then it does the next thing. It gives me a chance to see that I got it correct. All right. And you'll want to do something similar to that in the uh, memory game, because after you click the second one, you don't want it to just pop up and disappear right away. You want it to pop up and stay there for a second for how long? In fact, you can actually make that a set, right? How long does it stay up? Does it stay up for two seconds or five seconds? You know, you could configure that. In this case, what they do is they put a little pause in here by put, creating on the handler object, creating a new post delay, a new runnable. So they create essentially a new thread that simply runs the animation and delays for 2,000 milliseconds. That's two seconds. Animate is listed up here. I think we talked about that before. does some things, runs the animation, then it pauses for a couple seconds. Otherwise, then it, the card shakes its head and you get the answer again. That's most of what I wanted to show you for this. Because the last big thing I wanted to show you is getting a little pause in there. Uh, getting a little pause because you'll want to do that when you do your, um, when you do the memory game. I would like to pull up the coin example now, the second version of the coin example spend a little bit of time on that because that also has some of the capabilities that you want in the game. So Maybe you can make this applicable to the memory game. Okay, this one was, I showed you an example like this before. one has three rows of two coins. When you click it, it flips the coin. A good exercise might be see if you can get this to flip the coin and flip it back over after two seconds or whatever. That would be good practice for what you have to do in there. So let's look at this. We're going to spend our time looking at the fragment because that's really the only thing that's interesting in this example. This is a little more like yours. All right. In that example, they had hard coded, I think, four rows of buttons. And they just showed and hide it down. Showed and hid them. Uh, I'm taking a different approach, uh, approach here. I am inflating as many rows as I need. All right. So instead of having hard-coded in my main fragment layout, I have
excitement and flake, I have a horizontal linear layout that contains two image views. And so I loop through and I inflate that multiple times to get my multiple rows. So, most of the work in this is done in the create view, on create view. I make two array lists. And I've used this term before and I use it in a lot of classes, but I want to make sure you understand. What's it mean when I say that I have parallel arrays here? Because coins and views are parallel arrays or array lists. That you can work with both and work with both independently <coughs> or together? Um, well, you, yeah, that, that is true. The together part is the part that I'm more interested in. Okay? Let me give you a simpler example. Let's say I had an array of student first names. All right? So I have an array with however many elements. All right. We go down the list. Now, let's say I have an array of last names that correspond to it too. All right. A parallel array would be that you would be element zero, let's say, in the first name array and element zero in the last name array. You might be element one in the first name array and element one in the last name array, and so on down the line. So they're parallel. They're going to have the same number of elements because the elements match up. And they match up where the subscript of one, the, the, its match in the other array has the same subscript. All right? So if I find array, if I find your last name, all right, in element six of the array, I know your first name's also in element six. So I just have to find one of them to find the thing. Okay, so that's what I mean by parallel arrays. So I define these. On my create, I inflate the linear layout. I inflate the fragment main, which is a linear layout. I have to cast that as a linear layout because later I'm going to add stuff to it. And you can only add stuff to certain views. You can't add stuff to just any view. I can add views to a view group. So I have to make sure that whatever, I cast this to a view group. So that's why I cast it to a linear layout. I know it's a linear layout because again, I made that XML file. So I can tell the compiler I know that the compiler only expects to get a view, but I know more information. I know you're going to get a linear layout, therefore treat it like a linear layout. Okay, I loop through from, and I just have hard-coded 1 to 3, or 0 to 3. So this will do three rows, row 0 or one, row 1 and row 2. And I inflate this row layout, the inflate layout, which has my two images in it. All right. I then am going to make sure the parallel arrays match up. So I create two coin objects. All right, and add them to the coin array. I find inside that row that I inflated. I find the thing that has an ID of coin one and the thing that has an ID of coin two. So the first coin has a ID of coin one, the second one has an ID of coin two. Notice that find view by ID will work if we give it any kind of view whatsoever. All right? Now, in the main activity, we just say find view by ID. Right? We can do that because every activity has a view associated with it. We can also specify in other contexts where we're looking for that view. In this case, we're looking for that view in that row that we just inflated. So the row I just inflated, I'm looking for image one, or coin one, and coin one. So now I have my, I've set my two parallel. 
parallel arrays. All right. I do something real similar here and here to what I did I drew up on the board here. Coins and views are one-dimensional arrays, but this is sort of a grid. So I'm going to map this grid to the two-dimensional or the one-dimensional array. So two times i, there's two coins in each row, and I don't have an inner loop. I cheated because I know there's only two in there. And so this would be column zero of that array or, or that grid, and this would be column one. All right, so I do both of them at the same time. And I do the exact same thing as far as setting the on click listener for that. And then when I'm all done, I add the row that I just inflated to this view. So that's what I'm done. I, I get the, the view that consists of three rows, each containing two coins. Now, the set the image is kind of cute, okay? If a program can be cute, right? I give it an argument. That argument is the array element of the parallel array. So, first time through, let's say, I'm going to say set image two times i. First time through this loop, i is equal to zero. All right? So this is going to pull up set image, and I'm passing an argument of zero. This is set image, and I'm passing an argument of one. So zero and one. Zero and one. The first time through. What this does is it takes that image and determines whether it's heads or tails. If it's heads, it sets that image as resource, the same view. So we're using that subscript both for the coins and for the views because this is a parallel array. And if it's heads, we set that view to have a drawable of heads. If it's tails, we set it to be Now, the second time through the loop, we're going to add elements two and three to both arrays. So I will be one the second time through this loop, two and three, and we set those. Now, the on click, it's pretty basic. When I click on it, I flip the coin. All right? Not flip in terms of flipping it randomly. I, I flip it from heads to tails, tails to heads. Okay. So, what's V in this function? How would you describe V in the function? It's the index of the view and the index of the coin that's in the grid. Close. Yes. It's the image view of the coin that we clicked on. Because it's a view. All right? You're absolutely right. Our next step is going to be to find out what index that view has. And then we know what coin that corresponds to it. We can change the coin from heads to tails, tails to heads. And then we can reset the image. So. This view is the view that we clicked on. It's literally that view object that we clicked on. So what does flip do? Flip is going to look through and it's going to get the next element in the view table, the view array, and compare it to that view that was clicked on. Now, this is like foreshadowing from earlier. Right? Because notice I have a double equal sign. I kind of said in the past, the past, the past being 20 minutes ago, all right, that you use equals when you're doing object references. But here I'm doing an object reference. I'm looking at two views. But I'm using an equal. The, the, the equal equal, the two equal. Why do you think I'm doing that? Right. 
OK set image. Oops. And I give it the subscript. And if we look at the coin, the coin has a flip which says, if it's heads, make it not heads. Or whatever is heads is, make it the opposite of that. So if is heads is true, that makes it false. If, it's, if heads was false, it makes it true.
clicks and resets the Boolean to true. Now, for comparing images, is it, I mean, there's several ways I can think of. One is that you just set two temporary variables and you store them in there and then compare them. But is there an easier way to actually just store the pointers or to say, is this image that I, well, you would have the first image already there. So the second image, you could say, how does it match? How do you compare something from something you've already looked at? If that makes sense. Uh, I would I would have uh, an array with two elements in it, or an array list with two okay. elements in it. And when I click on when I click on you know, the nice thing about an array list is all you have to do is say add. Right. If you did an array, you'd have to say, do I want to add it in position one or position two? So I make an array list that you know there's only going to be two things in. All right, and. Initially, there's nothing in the array list. You click one thing, you add, and I would just add the subscript, all right? I would add this subscript that I find because that subscript can give me the view if I need it, and it can give me the coin, or, well, card, if you need it. So you can do both of them. So I would grab the subscript of each of them and just put that to an array list. And then do my thing. Uh, after the after the delay went, I'd compare to see if those two cards were equal, and then uh, either hide them back again or keep them showing. Uh, I would add a equals method to my card, where you pass a card another card, all right, and it tells you if they if they match each other. Because they will be different objects. If you have two jack of hearts on your board, those are two different objects. So you can't say equal equals. Because that will always show up not true. But if you have an equals method, like with the string, then you could pass a card, the second card, and say um, a card is equal if the face value and the suit matches. And you can even make it so that you could have settings, right? Uh, how did you do it, Mark? You had settings where it had to match the face value or just and suit or just the face value, right? Oh, uh, yeah, those are two options. Yeah, so you could actually pass the does the card match and pass a second parameter that says, do you want to do the first comparison that matches the whole 